One thing I truly appreciate about Nintendo Land is that it tries to include both solo and multiplayer options depending on how many people are available, but unfortunately there's a very clear disparity in my enjoyment between the two, with this game taking the wooden spoon. You play 5 rounds of follow the leader, and depending on what screen you look at, you'll face a different perspective or have said perspective obstructed by ink. I don't care that it's a game small children play, yet my smooth brain still gets confused by the second round because both I and small children are bored by the first round. All you do control wise is point the analog sticks in a certain direction and occasionally tilt the gamepad. That's it. That's the whole minigame. And I mean, sure, not every game is going to be a winner, but honestly, when you compare it to the Game & Watch title it's based on, I'd genuinely rather play the nearly 40 year old game than this. You can comfortably skip this one. The Wii U's gyro controls could be used quite brilliantly in some capacities, but it's a bit of a stretch to say Captain Falcon's Twister Race is one of them. What might have been fun if you used a first person perspective or even just a traditional F-Zero style of racing, instead just comes out as mediocre. The minigame gives you a limited amount of time to get from one gate to the next, with obstacles and heavy turns that you must adjust to by holding the gamepad sideways and tilting it left and right. The amount you have to tilt at points feels ridiculously far to the point I was holding the gamepad at near 90 degrees to make a turn. However, I will say that I did have connection issues with both games talked about so far, and this one especially was the case, so maybe I didn't get the best impression of it. I will say that this is significantly better than the Octopus game in my opinion, but like, going from being bad to just being below average. You can probably find games on your phone that are as, if not more, enjoyable than this one. Play it once and maybe you're good. The first, and not the last, touchscreen based minigame in this collection. This game is very reminiscent of the original on NES. It's an auto scrolling action game, flying from island to island and avoiding obstacles along the way. Except rather than using a good control scheme, you use the stylus instead to guide your balloon boy. I mean, it's fine, it's functional, it works, but there isn't much in it that kept me for longer than I got footage for. It could be because I don't particularly enjoy auto scrolling in many, if any, games but the pace of the game is a little on the slow side. The first few minutes I played this one, I thought to myself, oh hey, this actually isn't too bad. Yet by the time I'd finally lost, I was thinking, yeah, I'm good. I have a fondness for puzzle games, no matter how simple the concept said puzzle may have. Because of this, I actually managed to get more enjoyment out of this one than I expected. It's just a straightforward visualisation game where you have to draw the path to fruit for Yoshi to collect before completing the level, with the caveat being you're not able to see anything on the gamepad screen while you're planning out the journey. It's about as complex as another free game you can get on your phone, sure, but something about this one I find far more charming than the Captain Falcon game possibly because it's much easier to accurately control what you're doing in this one. Nonetheless, while it does ramp up the difficulty as time goes on, it's still kind of shallow in concept and I could see people getting bored of it quite quickly. This one I actually enjoyed quite a bit. It's not anything that mind blowing, it's just an on-rail shooter whereby you shoot by flicking with the touchpad but as someone with a fondness for these type of games, I was partial to it. I'll put it this way. Out of every game so far, beyond when I played it before, I only played each game once to get its footage. By this game, this is where I actively played it and got more footage because I enjoyed my time with it. As has been said, the game is an on-rail shooter, swiping shurikens at the ninjas to either attack them or defend yourself from incoming attacks. You have special attacks activated by swiping in certain ways, which is a neat addition to a decent minigame. The one major detriment I found in my opinion is that I was able to beat it in 10 minutes, which is a bit underwhelming. The ending hints that you're meant to play it again, but like, I didn't really want to. I enjoyed it as it is and would maybe pick it up again at a random point. For now though, it's good. The first game on this list that can be played by more than one person. And to be clear, even though the list so far probably looks like this in your head, 
it's much more like this. Zelda's representation in this collection is an on-rail shooter, though you can choose to wield a sword if so inclined, whereas using the gamepad allows the player to wield a bow. The bow gameplay is alright, albeit if you ask me what my favourite Nintendo console Legend of Zelda on-rail shooter game is, then this game has some stiff competition. The sword fighting draws comparisons to another Wii game too, that being Wii Sports Resort Sword Fighting Showdown, and ultimately it's these comparisons that kind of sour me a little on this one. It's not to say it isn't good, because I quite enjoy it even leaving my bias towards rail shooters to the side. The cutie aesthetic is rather charming, the music remixes are probably my favourite in the games as a whole, and it offers much more than pretty much everything before it combined. But if I was to compare it to the game I think it's fair to say it shares liberties with, it's not quite on that level for me. The mechanics don't differ much between sword fighting and this attraction, but not having a versus mode is what I think is missing quite a bit from this set. There's a time attack, which is a fun distraction for all of 5 minutes, but between Resort giving you the Showdown, which is pretty similar, Speed Slice, a better alternative mode than time attack, and then the regular arena mode that is a great time single player and multiplayer, Zelda Battle Quest sits in its shadow. Still a good time though. Small disclaimer for this one, I have to use a terrible thing which is but I think that this game is a lot of fun with multiplayer. I, not a multiplayer, had to work with some co-op AI that, I think it's fair to say, wasn't the brightest bulb. The minigame is very similar to Pikmin on a diet level, as it excludes getting parts for a ship and instead is a linear action game of sorts. You're either Olimar commanding Pikmin with the gamepad touchscreen, or you're a Pikmin doing the job yourself because your captain is an idiot. Playing this by myself, albeit slightly lacking, still had fun to be had. What trumps this over the Zelda minigame for me is that I think this would be an absolute blast with friends, getting the core idea of Pikmin allowing you to diversify work and jobs in a real time setting tremendously. It's definitely one that excels with other people, in my opinion. Uh, quickly, before I start this part, I do want to mention that I couldn't get decent multiplayer footage by myself, so instead I've opted to use Project Longplay's video on Nintendo Land instead. Uh, links to the video in question and their channel in the description. There's a reason why all the competitive co-op games are in the top 5, and that's because every single one is always played a dozen times between my friends and me. It was tough to choose which I think is the worst of the bunch, as none of them are deserving of being the worst, but I went with this one. It's effectively just tag, chase, it, whatever you call it. An incredibly simple premise, and that's why it works so well. I'd argue it's the quintessential minigame to show what the Wii U can do effectively. Toads have to find Mario, but Mario can use the gamepad and see where all the toads are at all given times. My only gripe with this game mode would be that there are only 3 maps, whereas I'd selfishly like 10 or 20, but that's only because I play it so much whenever I can with friends that I've already played these 3 to death. Yeah, there isn't really anything negative to say, it's pretty great. Much like my gripe with Mario Run, had this minigame got more than two maps to pick from and play between, this might be up there as my favourite game of the bunch. Nonetheless, while it's not my favourite competitive multiplayer game, it's probably my favourite of the concepts. One to four players use Wii remotes to play as animals that collect sweets, either leaving them in bowls or keeping them on their character until a certain amount is reached. What's getting in the way is the gamepad user, who controls two little fellas that are hunting the animals to try and stop them. Three hits and the animals are done. The speed of hunters and animals are the same if the animal doesn't have any sweets, but at any point a sweet is picked up, it slows the animals. You can drop them at any point then pick them back up, but there will always be an inherent advantage for the hunters in the speed department. However, from the gamepad perspective, the camera pans out as far as the distance between the two hunters. If they're close together, then you can let animals outside of their view collect the sweets and win. If they split apart, then the camera gives them more coverage over the field, but as they're only as fast as the animals, then it's much harder to get them individually than as a duo. Unfortunately, the shortcomings of the aforementioned two maps stop this from being the best game of the bunch, but that doesn't change the fact that this is a stellar time. And to complete the trilogy, the final competitive multiplayer of the bundle. Luigi's Ghost Mansion has the gamepad user as the ghost and the Wii Remote users as the hunters. You shine a light on the ghost to drain its health, or the ghost manages to hunt the players to win. This is the competitive minigame which, in my eyes, is objectively the most well-rounded. The ghost is invisible, 
only able to be detected by the Wii Remote's rumble feature. It's a rough way of detecting a ghost distance from a hunter, which the team can work around by communicating with each other, letting people know who senses the ghost closest to them before they either fend them off or inevitably get caught. The ghost has their own things to use too. They're able to dash to either escape in a pinch or attack a hunter quickly, as well as a timed charge attack which, if it hits the hunters, drains them of their torch battery. However, both of these make the ghost visible to the hunters, which can lead to it backfiring if the team works around it. I can only have you take my word for it, but this is an exceptional minigame to play, and a really good laugh. No matter the group of people, it's, in my opinion, pure party game goodness. With five of the six single player only minigames clogging up the bottom of the list, Donkey Kong's Crash Course shines like no other beacon in this collection. It is unquestionably one of the most addicting games in the collection, and one that I sincerely wished saw a spin-off release expanding on it. You have a course where you navigate by tilting the gamepad left and right, opening gates and paths by pressing the shoulder buttons, spinning the analog sticks and blowing into the microphone. It legitimately sounds so simple in concept, and that's why I think it works so well. Fortunately, I'm what people know in the biz as a Donkey Kong Crash Course ledge. Incredible. Oh, oh you. It's the first time I've met anyone who could beat 10 seconds. Remind me later to get your human autograph. Ugh, oh, yeah, what can I say? I'm a pretty cool guy. Well, time to do what DK does best and bash this one out. Yeah, okay, so on reflection, I've deduced that this game is legitimately impossible, but barring that fact, I still think the game is such an entertaining little time that has consistently taken my attention. If the game was available on Switch, where things can be loaded in at no time at all, it would legitimately be my go-to time killer game. But you can't call yourself the Donkey Kong Crash Course Ledge without beating the impossible. I did it. I beat the impossible Wii U game. And nothing can undermine- Wait, what? Oh. And finally, to top it all off, the game that blends pretty much all of the best elements of these games together. Metroid Blast has three game modes and not a single one of them are a dud. A mission based single and multiplayer mode, as well as two versus game modes that either let a player use specific controllers or not. Whether you're controlling the airship with the gamepad or on the ground with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, both control incredibly well and make it much more interesting than the Zelda or Pikmin games for me. With the land versus air game or ground battle alternative, they are not only able to keep my interest, but also be a game that my dad enjoys playing as well, and for that, it's always going to give me at least quite a bit of happiness and appreciation. I wish I had more to say about it, but it's just like, really good? Uh, huh. I don't really have a lot else to say. Watch my other videos if you enjoyed it. Like and subscribe too. And that's a threat.